so much dysfunction, upheaval, angst, uh, especially in our country. I mean, how do you have joy in the middle of all of that, especially with the pandemic? Uh, it, it's interesting and, and how we've had to function so differently. Um, so how do you have joy in the middle of all of that? Uh, there's a lot of books you can get on the internet. I, I went to Amazon.prime, the source of all books. Uh, it's amazing how many books I've actually bought there. Uh, and so I just typed in how to have a happy life. And so here's just a couple of topics uh, that came up. Uh, one of them is by the Dalai Lama, which is the, it's the book of joy. So I guess if you grab this and start doing the things that he says in the book, you're going to find uh, joy uh, from his perspective. Uh, there's another book called In Awe. Uh, subtitle, Rediscover Your Childlike Wonder uh, to Unleash Inspiration, Meaning, and Joy. Uh, so I guess get back to your childhood, uh, and then you'll be so much happier. I really like the next one. Uh, how to be happy. This person's a pragmatist, because what's the subtitle? Or at least less sad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least they were honest, right? Uh, so if you go through and uh, type it in, uh, How to Have a Joyful Life, you're going to get many more books than you could probably read in a lifetime. Uh, but when you read the scriptures of how to find joy, it, it's so different than what these books tell you. Because it's, it's coming from God, and it's going to run counter to what you think. And, and David is going to write a lot about uh, how, to, how to have a joyful life in this uh, the psalm in particular. Uh, and it's very interesting because when you think about David's life, um, he had all kinds of issues, didn't he? I mean, he had issues with his family after Bathsheba. He had, you know, had sexual sin, all the problems that came from that. His children turned against them, total dysfunctionality. He had people in, in his empire that wanted to undermine his rule and get him fired, removed from his job. Sound familiar? I mean, this stuff's been going on for thousands of years. I mean, all kinds of problems. And so he gave a lot of thought to, how can I have joy in the middle of all of this? Is it possible? Because he says, as a person who follows hard after God, if you know God, the essence of joy, you by definition should be joyous. And so in this psalm, he's going to share with you uh, what he discovered. And I'll show you how countercultural his thinking is by giving you the main idea. Uh, so if you walk out of here thinking, hey, what was that guy talking about today? Main idea? I'm going to give it to you right now. So you cannot walk away, not know exactly what David says about finding joy. So notice how countercultural it is when you read what he says about having a blessed, happy life. He's going to tell you that a joyful life, if we can see it, there it is. Uh, this comes from some angel in some sphere of heaven that just makes this appear. Uh, joyful living is what? It's wedded to mournful living. Is that a typo? No, that's from Psalm 32. So, a joyful living is wedded to mournful living. What do you mean? You're walking around sad all the time, crying all the time. You're just an emotional wreck. No, he's not talking about that. He's talking about a joyful life is a life wedded to mourning over one's personal sin. We are great as a nation, uh, especially now, at pointing to everybody else's sin. Even our forefathers. Look at all the sin they did. And no one's pausing to think, but what about me? And, and so David says, hey, if you want to have a really happy life, a life full of joy despite what's going on in your life, it must be a mournful life that it looks at yourself in a realistic way and, and, and is confessional. Mournful over the point that, Lord, I've sinned. I need to confess my sin. And when you clean me up, I have joy because my conscience is clean. There's going to be eight principles that he's going to cover here uh, to develop and unpack his concept of joyful living. Uh, and before we get into these, I want to kind of lay the context of what, what, who he's speaking to here. He is not speaking primarily to a non-Christian. He's speaking primarily to a Christian, somebody who follows God, who knows God. So we're going to talk about this from a, a perspective of a shepherd speaking to sheep who, who, know, who follow the good shepherd Jesus. But we want to stop before we do that, because I'd be remiss of my job as a pastor if I didn't, because if you do not know God by faith, if you're not walking with him, then you for sure do not have joy, because you don't know the God, you don't have a relationship with the God, uh, because you, you're cut off from him. So uh, we want to just challenge you, and um, what the scriptures say about having a, a right relationship with God brings total joy to your life, because now all of a sudden, when you know God, he's at the center of your life, Everything makes sense because your life's related to him. Your work ethic, your ethics, how you raise children, uh, how, you, how you love your husband, your wife, your dating life. Everything has God as the center. Everything makes sense, plus you're forgiven. Uh, Paul talks about this in Romans 5.1, uh, where he's speaking about how a person is saved. 
Uh, what does he say? Therefore, in light of all I said in the last four chapters, having been, personally, Paul says, justified by faith, not works. Notice the cause-effect relationship. You have faith in the person work of Jesus. You automatically have what? Do you see it? Peace. You have shalom. You have peace. Who do you have peace with? God who is holy. And how do you get it? Notice the preposition. What's the preposition? Through. Who do you get peace through? Through a faith relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll just stop and say before we get into this psalm about believers, he's talking to believers, but we must stop to say to those who don't believe in God, your, your life won't make sense and have true joy until you have a faith relationship with, with Jesus who can only give you peace and give you joy. What he's going to talk about in this passage uh, is not uh, what we would call a positional uh, joy. You get that when you get saved and come to Christ. We're talking about practical joy because your joy is going to fluctuate in your life based upon uh, your response to mourning over your sin. Translated, the more that you mourn over your sin and deal with your sin before God's throne as a believer, uh, the more joy that you will have. So what does he say here in this passage to Christians? Let's, we're going to look at three things this morning. Number one, he's going to say joyful living focuses on praise. Praise. Um, I don't know how you're wired. If you're a negative kind of person, this sermon is for you. What did he say? If you want to be joyful, uh, you've got to focus on praise. Is the glass half empty to you or is it half full? Well, I don't know how you're wired. But he says, if you want to have a happy, blessed life, focus on being a person who praises God for what he's done in your life. So what does he say? Number one, he says, I wrote this. It's a Psalm of David. What kind of Psalm is it? It's a contemplation. But it's not just a heavy-duty thinking contemplation. It's the kind of contemplation that leads to praise. Because as you think about what God's done in your life, and you're overcome with that grace he's given you, it leads to praising him. So notice what he says. Who has a blessed life? And just take the word blessed here uh, and, and put in the word joy. A, 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 a joyful life, a blessed life. Uh, notice the components. Is one whose transgression is forgiven. Two, is one whose sin is covered. Three, is one with whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Four, it's a blessed life if there's no deceit in that life between the person in question and God. You're not trying to play games with God. You're authentic. You're transparent. We'll get into that in just a minute. Uh, this uh, concept of blessedness in the Hebrew text, which this is written in Hebrew because uh, the Old Testament is Hebrew because they were Jews and spoke Hebrew. Um, the very first word here, blessed, uh, is uh, it's supposed to be a verb, but it's not. Uh, blessed is not a verb. And the reason why it's placed there is because it's totally emphatic. Uh, and he places it first in the sentence when he communicates how to have a blessed life by putting it first in the sentence. So like, you ever driven across a really big speed bump bigger than your car? This happened to me the other day when we were out shopping on Friday. I have a low, you know, S60 uh, black Volvo. It does not negotiate speed bumps very well. I, well, I didn't quite see one the other day. Do you know what I mean? And you, you're, you're the car that leaves all the scrape marks on the speed bump. And then you will never forget that speed bump is there, correct? So think of this as a grammatical speed bump where he says, hey, wake up. You want to have a joyful life? How do you, how do you have it? Well, let's talk about you need to pay attention to four kinds of sin. Hey, I, I, I just thought there was one kind of sin. Meh. No, there's a variety. So what does he say? You want to have a blessed life? You must be a person whose transgression is what? Forgiven. He says you must be, have, be a person whose sin is covered, who does not have iniquity imputed uh, by God to your life, uh, and who has no deceit. Let's look first at uh, move, moving systematically and progressively through them. Uh, he says you, you have a happy life when your transgression uh, is forgiven. Well, the Hebrew word, pesha. Pesha means open revolt. Open revolt. Like, where's our nation at right now? Open revolt. It's unbelievable. So the law says this, and you say, there is no way I'm doing that. So if you want an illustration of open revolt, in case you can't get your mind around it, think Portland. Open revolt, right? That the law says this, and you're saying, I'm, I'm part of Antifa. I'm attacking everything about that. I'm going to bring in the whole house down, man. That's open revolt. I'm going to throw frozen bottles at officers, fire laser beams at them, whatever it is, open revolt. Every night, mayhem, revolt. That's Pesha. It's the law says this, but I in my own sinfulness, I'm going to attack that with every ounce of my being. He says, blessed is the man, and we are all prone for revolt. Every time you choose sin over God, it's Pesha. He says, blessed is the man uh, who his open rebellion is what? Forgiven. Forgiven. 
The Hebrew word for to forgive here uh, is the word to remove a heavy pack off of your back. How many are in the military? Probably most of the church. Slightly putting their arms up. I'm not going to identify myself. Yes. Yeah. Have you ever had a heavy pack on your back? That's a softball question. You know, you can talk in this room. I give you permission. Yeah. yeah. You're so quiet. The room's so big. I can't say anything. Have you ever had a heavy pack on your back? Yeah. When I was uh, 12 years old and I was working on uh, my life merit badge, and try, I was one away from Eagle, trying to nail that down. I was doing, uh, uh, you know, different... Um, this is merit badges. And so one of them was this hiking thing we did. And so I was in Southern California, in the desert where I was raised, near Palm Springs. Uh, we, went, we had a couple day hike. And so we went from the desert floor near Palm Springs uh, up to Mount San Jacinto, about 6,600 feet. So you went from sand to snow. And so, you know, you're in sand, and the next thing you know, you're sleeping in snow, it's freezing and everything. And you're taking steps, you're losing your whole leg in the snow as you're hiking. It was, it was brutal. Um, but I didn't have a pack back then. This was 1969. I didn't have a pack. Uh, and so I went to my dad's best friend, Nick Nicholas, who uh, was a Marine in uh, World War II, was on Iwo Jima and Peleliu, B.A.R. machine gunner. And they only gave Nick the B.A.R. because he was five foot seven and the meanest guy among all the guys. But he became my spiritual mentor, as I've said before, over my lifetime, uh, my dad's best friend, as he poured into my life uh, as a young man, this Marine. But I went to Nick's house and I said, hey, Nick, I, I know you, you got a bunch of Marine gear from World War II. I, I need a pack. So I was 12, and so he said, hey, I'll give you my old Marine pack from World War II. You ever seen one of those? You ever use one? The minute you use it, you think to yourself, how did we ever win with this pack on their back? Because the pack he gave me uh, was, had metal chain, then sewn a, a strap back here, but the metal chain cut into you here. That was my first mistake. And so I have this pack on, and then I gave it to my mother. I packed it to a certain degree, and then I told my mom, could you, could you pack my food for me? So she did. She packed all the things that I love to eat in cans. <laughs> it was unbelievable. And so she knows I like sardines, so she put sardines in there. Sardines like in tomato sauce. And so we hiked up to this high altitude, and we, we grew up in 800 feet below sea level where I grew up. We're at 6,600 feet where we can't breathe. And we sat down on a big rock when we were done with our hike, and everybody's pulling out, you know, their what, beef jerky to eat. And I opened up a can of sardines with tomato sauce. I lost the entire troop. They're like, what is that odor? And then guys just started moving away from me. You know, but the, but the thing is... I hauled, so I opened my pack up. I actually hadn't looked at it. I opened my pack up and there's all these cans. And I'm like, I drug these up the side of this mountain. Are you kidding me? Now it is a living illustration of sin. Sardines, by the way, they're not sinful. You can eat them. But you don't want to drag them up in a, in a World War II Marine pack, right? So when he says, blessed is the man whose transgression is open revolt against God is what? Forgiven. That God is the only person qualified to take the pack off your back. He takes that pack of sin off your back, and it's freeing to, to have that open revolt forgiven. He, that's why he says that person is blessed. Then he says, uh, blessed is the person whose sin is covered. Sin, hata in Hebrew, means uh, you purposely miss the target. Uh, I grew up, uh, my dad is a federal agent. I've been to a zillion gun ranges. I think I've fought, fired every kind of weapon you can imagine. I get the shooting at a target thing. Because when you're shooting at a target 100 yards, 200 yards, however many yards, you're wanting to hit the target, right? The metal plates and stuff. I mean, who wants to fire and purposely miss? And then when they, they trained me as a sheriff chaplain and at the gun range and all that I went through there, I mean, same thing. You're on a firing range, you're wanting to hit the targets. Who's going to aim off the target? Never seen anybody do that. This is what hata means. Blessed is a person uh, who has sin, hata, about them, and it's covered. This type of sin is purposely missing the target. Applied to the spiritual, spiritual realm, it means God said do X, and you purposely did what? I'm doing Y. And you, oh, you have all your reasons why you want to do Y. Uh, but, but God said, I, I, this is sin, don't do that, and you're, well, I'm doing it today. He says, blessed is the person who has purposely missed my law, rationalized their sin. You place a bunch of people around you that believe that this, is, uh, this which is sin is not really sin, and you feel good about yourself because you're surrounded yourself with those people, and they're causing you uh, to, to continue to miss my holiness. Uh, you're not blessed if you live with those kind of people and act that way. But he says, blessed is the person uh, who has come to me and confessed their chata, their willful departure. Uh, I will bless them.
which means if you don't come to God and confess that, uh, you will not find uh, true joy. Um, <laughs> uh, this is kind of like a confessional booth up here. I don't know, does it look like one? Well, it could be a confessional booth because, see, when I, I've, had my, I've had my fill in my lifetime of open revolt, Peshaw, and I've had my opportunities to commit chata, missing the target of God. Uh, I told you this years ago, and maybe you're new and you don't know me, so I'll, I'll tell you again. Maybe you're older and you forgot. It, it's okay. Um, so when I was in sixth grade, 1969, uh, they made me the head of the safety team at the entire school. This was a prestigious thing. And uh, so you had to have really good grades. I was a straight-A student, and, and, and they made me the head of it. So you got a special white belt that went around your waist, and it was cool. And I, I would just, like, wear that to school. But they also gave you a master de key to every room in the entire school. Awesome. So I began to investigate. One day, one day, I moseyed on into the teacher's book room. Yeah, and I began to look in there. And there's no one in there, no windows, one door, steel door. I had the key, it went in. And I'm looking around, and I see the arithmetic for sixth grade teacher's manual right there. And I'm like, whoa. I pulled it out. It was in a corner. Off in a corner was dark. I pulled it out, and I opened it up. And in there, in red ink, were all the answers to all the problems of math for the whole year. What do you think I did? Are you listening to me? What, what do you think I did? I took it. I took it. I, I took it out of there because everybody trusted me. They'd always say, he's such a nice kid and everything. I'm like, eh, you don't really know me. I am all about Pesha, even though I don't even know what it means at this age. But so anyway, so I, I stole the math book and I took it home. And in the cul-de-sac where I live, my best friend, uh, uh, Robert Vance, uh, I, I approached him and said, hey, Robert, hey, you want to make an A in math this year? You know, hang with me. And so for one year, we used that math book to solve all the math problems for the whole year. I mean, and I was a straight A student. What was I thinking? And so we, that was the year of fractions. Do you think I can do a fraction now? <laughs> you know, eventually I became, a, I became a landscaper, having to put in yards and planter boxes and build them and make bids and how much dirt I needed, how much stone, how much, all that stuff. And then I started building stuff. I, I, you know, I, uh, I got saws. I got to make precision cuts. Let's see, if I add a two and a quarter to three and a quarter, what do I get? Who knows? I don't know. It's kind of eyeball it. And so... Do not ever come to me for fractions to be solved. Did you hear me? Because I can't do them. Why? Because of sin. Sin. I stole that book. I eventually put it back at the end of the year. But when I got to junior high in seventh grade, they, they took us in a room, put us at a desk, and they said, before we place you in math in the junior high, we have to take a test to see what you learned about fractions in sixth grade. <laughs> I'm toast. I took that test, I totally funked that test. You know, they're putting me in remedial math. So I'm just telling you, if you're a young person, do not follow my lead, okay? Because I understand Pesha, revolting sin, and then I understand Chata, purposely missing. I was a Christian, I was an only three-year-old Christian then, but I knew exactly what I was doing, and the point is, it haunted me forever. So have you, have you done this? Well, have you done this? Paul says, or David says, if you want to live a blessed life, don't do that kind of sin, and if you do, make sure you step before God and come clean of that sin. So I've now come clean. I feel so much better. Okay? Iniquity. Uh, blessed is the person whose uh, iniquity has not been imputed to him. To uh, Iniquity, the Hebrew word uh, 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 avon is the word, means that which is crooked and twisted. You could do a whole sermon series on this. What does our culture do to what used to be called sin? They twist it. They give it a different meaning. So oh, that's, not, that's, not, that's not sinful. Um, uh, and, and so he says, have you got this in your life that what you're doing is twisted and distorted from what God said? And he says, if you do this, God is going to impute that sin to your life, which means if you like spreadsheets, this is your word. To impute sin means you just stuck it in the ledger sheet. It's in column whatever. And then on judgment day, when you stand before God as a Christian, just go read 1 Corinthians 3. When you stand before God as a Christian, you're going to get into heaven, no problemo. But He's going to say, let's test the quality of your, of your Christian walk. What were the motivations? Your, why did you do what you did for me? Let's test those things. He's going to be looking at the ledger sheet of your walk. So the idea of, to lead a joyful life is to keep that side of your life clean through confession. He says, if you have iniquity, confess that. He will bless you. And then he says, live a life that has no deceit about it. Meaning that before God, you can stand before God and say, God, I, I, am, I am transparent. I, I come clean before you. I don't try to hide anything from you. So if you have that kind of thought in your Christian walk that, well, I'm really pretty good. And there's really not much to confess. 
what should you do? Confess that you don't confess. I'll, I'll submit it to you this way. Just do it this way. God answers this prayer quickly. Dear God, in my own arrogance, I didn't think I had very much to confess. Show me what I should confess, and I will deal with it. Guess what? Do it today about 1230. You will know at 1231 what you must do. Because he said, no, if you want to live a life of joy, don't be deceitful before God because, well, he knows what you're doing anyway. Point two, joyful living focuses on the past. Uh, he says, when I kept silent about my sin, my groans, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the draught of summer. I mean, if you're a young person and you're listening to your parents trying to tell you, well, you know, hey, back in, when I was young, this is how we did things. And they're trying to give you some moral advice and stuff. And I know I was young before. You tend to listen to your parent and think, well, what do they know? And, you know, they're not living in the world I'm living in. Oh, they know. And no new sin under the sun, the same kind of sin. You should probably listen to him. David says, you know, listen to the past. What was my past? When I sinned and I didn't say anything about it to God, it affected my body. It was like a psychosomatic disorder. The more I was silent, the more my life fell apart. He said, it's almost like my bones hurt. So let's go back to me, sixth grade, what year? 1969. Do you think that whole year was just spiritual bliss for me? Hmm, no, no. The whole year, I am kid you not. I mean, every night when Robert and I would get together and, it, and do our math, it's like, hey, man, we all can't get, we can't ace everything all year. So you miss number two, I miss number four. And then uh, this is what we did all year. It's unbelievable. Um, you find this shocking? Yeah, no, I did it because you've done it, those kinds of things too. So I, I had no inner peace that whole year. It was like all year, it's like God's doing this to me. Marty, Marty. Take the book back. I know, Lord, not now. There's a big test coming up. I need the book. Marty, you know, take the book back. No, 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 no. I kept that book. I mean, to my own shame, I kept that book. And then, and then now I'm paying the penalty for it because now I have to work harder. I actually had to go out and buy a, 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 a measure, what do they call them? Tape measure that had stenciled on it all of the fractions. I kid you not. I actually went out and I, and I bought a book a couple years ago on how to do fractions, and I'm working on it at night, you know, a couple years ago. I mean, not just a few years ago, because I can't do them. So, so this is what sin does to you, doesn't it? You're thinking, oh, I can totally get away with this. It's not going to cost me anything. Oh, yeah, it will. Yeah, it will cost you. And it will haunt you, because God will constantly be speaking to you, telling you, you need to repent of that. So David says, learn from my example. Don't sit idly by in sin. Because silence regarding your sin is open scandal before the throne of God. He hears it. He sees it. You're not going to fool him. So don't learn the hard way is what, what a David is saying. And when you come before God and you focus on your past and you're not silent, but you're vocal about your sin, God will clean your life up and restore you and joy will be there. And then lastly, he says, joyful living focuses on God's provision, his provision. Well, what is God's provision when we sin? What does he say? I acknowledged my sin to you, my sin, my chata, and you and my iniquity, my crookedness, uh, that I've not hidden. See, he came out in the open. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. How, how did God respond? Well, you forgave me. You forgave my iniquity. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. He said, I harbored it, and you were waiting there, waiting for me, to confess it, and you were waiting to forgive me. You, you, you got my attention by convicting me of my sin, but you were there waiting to forgive me. I acknowledged my sin. What does confession mean? Did I explain that to you? Okay, so confession. What does confession mean? Confession means that you're agreeing with God what sin is. You're not arguing with God. You are confessing to God. When I was in high school, I had a terrible vocabulary. I mean, a, a really foul mouth, let's put it that way. And I was a Christian, and I used to look at my Bible and think, where does it say I cannot cuss? Because I would look for the word cuss, and I didn't see it. And all those passages about don't let filthy communication come out of your mouth and stuff, and I'm like, well, that doesn't apply to this. It's, 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 sinners are crafty. And, and so he says, you know, when I finally came clean of my sin and, and dealt with it, uh, then you were there to forgive me. I, when I was reading that this week, I was thinking, it's, it's like the picture of the prodigal son. You know the story in Luke 15? And you know, you know the, the father divvies up his, his inheritance to the sons, and the one son takes it all and just goes out and lives a life of just total evil. And then that son finally wakes up spiritually. God gets his attention, and he confesses his sin. 
and he comes back to his father's house. And we know from the story in Luke 15, Jesus says that the father, who's going to represent the heavenly father, uh, is, is, is constantly standing on the hillside, looking out at the, at the countryside, looking for his son to come home. And then one day he sees him because he knows his son's walk, and that's him. And as the son's approaching, you know the story? What's, what's the father do? He runs. He runs to that son in his tunic and his sandals, you know, and he, you know, nails him like in the end zone, hugs him, he's kissing all over his neck. And why is he so happy? Because his son has confessed his sin and has come home to say, Dad, I, I'm just coming home. I, I've done wicked things. And this is an illustration, Jesus says, of the sinner, of the non-Christian or the Christian, the, sin, the sinner who comes to God for the first time, or the Christian who says, God, I have sinned as a, as a son or daughter of God. And they, they come back, and what does he do? He doesn't say, what did you think you were doing? You know? No, he says, no, I'm here for you. I'm here to forgive you and restore you. Uh, and, and then what did the father do in Luke 15? He threw the son a party, a welcome home party. I don't know what you've done as a Christian, but I have a hunch you've probably done some of the things we've talked about, the types of sin, the open revolt, the crookedness, the perverse things, those types of things, shaking your fist in God's face, you know, because it's, it's, it's easy to do. Uh, you can do it as a husband. If I'm called to honor my wife, uh, I've been married 40 years. I can tell you there's, op there's opportunity to, to not honor your wife and do things that dishonor her and destroy a relationship. Is that you? If you're a child in a relationship and you don't like what mom and dad have to say and you overtly tell them that you're going to follow their rules but covertly you're working against them, I, I've been down all those roads. But if you sinned like that, nothing's too great for God, the father, not to say, come back. And it's come, I will run toward you. If you are a, a Christian, uh, I think today's the day that you, you say to God, I come clean, whatever that sin is. I, and I'm sure the Spirit is, is telling you right now, you might not have stolen the math book. I mean, it's something else. God's telling you right now exactly what that is. Jesus is telling you, come back. I want to forgive you when you confess. He will restore you, uh, and then he will bless you with great joy. Let me pray for you. God, we bow in humility before you. We are sinners. Uh, we are broken people living in a broken world. Uh, and we thank you for being the kind of God that we see in the, the prodigal son's story. You don't write us off. Uh, you're the father who searches each day uh, for the son, the daughter to return home. And today it's a return home for many people. We pray that you would uh, help them to understand that just how much you have forgiven them. You're not going to pull the dirty laundry out of the past. Uh, you're going to call them forward to new life. And you're going to put your peace uh, in the sails of their life and push them forward down the road of life. Just thank you for who you are, how great your mercy is toward us. May we live in such a way that our lives are full of the joy that David talks about. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been good to have you in worship, and we pray that you have a really great week. Uh, and we will see you uh, next Lord's Day. And may the Lord bless you, and may his face shine upon you. Amen.